Good morning, friends. I'm so glad you decided to join me to get your day started with a biblical perspective. Happy Tuesday. Today we're continuing our womanhood series, so we're just going to jump right on in. Recently, as in like two days ago, I started reading a book called Hollywood Babylon, and it's an overview of how Hollywood was started. And one of the parts of the book that was super interesting and stuck out to me was that in order to get people to go to the movie theaters, they realized that they had to make icons out of the celebrities and actors. After all, these were just average people who came to an audition and now they're putting them on the big screen. I don't think it sounded, I haven't done a ton of research in this portion of the chapter yet, but it didn't sound like people cared that much. So they decided we have to make these people idols and icons to get people to actually want to go watch them on the big screen. And more importantly, pay to go see the movie. I've also learned the more conspiracies I follow, I've really come to the place where I don't believe too much in coincidences anymore. I hate to say it, but... I just don't think many things are super organic. I think a lot of things are planned and calculated. And the same point can be made regarding social media trends. I'm not sure these trends are organic. Is there an AI algorithm somewhere starting a trend and seeing how many people would copy? I don't know. But I think what we can agree on is so many of our choices, even down to the way we choose to dress or do our hair, our makeup, how we present ourselves, is most likely influenced by what we see and what trends are trending. And I'm sure there's an argument that it's always been this way. Fashion, the way we do our makeup, our hair, there's always been influence of what, you know, is it Dior is or what Chanel is? Like these brands or these icons have always kind of influenced the idea of fashion. I just feel like maybe it's a little more aggressive and in our face now because of social media. But long story short, I think we can all agree fashion trends have always been a thing. So today we're actually going to talk about the trend of makeup. And don't worry, I'll link it into a biblical perspective as well. (laughs) But I've always wanted to research makeup, so I was like, okay, I'm going to do it for this episode. Makeup originated in Egypt around 6000 BC. The Egyptians believed that makeup was a symbol of wealth, and it also appealed to the gods. So both men and women wore it. We have scriptural evidence that Jezebel put on makeup in 2 Kings. Also, stay tuned. I kind of want to do a podcast on Jezebel. In ancient Greece, prostitutes often wore red lip paint, and this was made out of red dye and crocodile feces, which is disgusting. Eventually, a law was passed that allowed the punishment of prostitutes if they didn't wear red lipstick because it was thought that they were trying to pretend that they were just a lady. In the Victorian era in the early 1900s, makeup was actually considered inappropriate for nice women and only worn by stage performers and prostitutes. In 1910, the first mascara named after Mabel Wilbeline's sister was created. Is that maybe it's Maybelline, right? Makeup became more of fashionable due to the influence of the theater and the ballet stars. In 1920, makeup became more popular, especially in cities, as women began to wear more dramatic makeup to reflect their newfound independence. Okay, again, Hollywood. This is interesting. Hollywood stars and flappers influenced makeup trends, and women began to identify as respectable while still wearing makeup. I will say, I'm only one chapter in Hollywood Babylon, but I think Hollywood has influenced so many things. I can't wait to read the book and like tell you guys about it. Okay, and then we're going to get to 1960s and 1970s, of course. Feminism. Feminism. Um, many women in the Western world chose to go without cosmetics because... Apparently wearing cosmetics means you're oppressed, I guess. I don't know. So that's the journey of makeup, a quick snapshot. This also led me to my thought on Botox. I've always been curious, where did Botox come from? Where has it been around? So let's talk about it. Botox really hasn't been around for that long, which I didn't know. Okay, it was invented in the 1920s. But Botox wasn't actually used to treat wrinkles until later. It was used for a couple other things. In 1989, the FDA approved, I'm not going to say the chemical or whatever it is because I don't know how to say it, but basically the, the chemical agent or whatever it is that contains Botox for therapeutic use. So in 1989, Botox was legal to use by the FDA for therapeutic reasons. By 1997, Botox was used to freeze wrinkles in celebrities and those who could afford the treatment. I think Botox has probably become 
more affordable since then. In 2002, the FDA approved Botox Cosmetics as a temporary cosmetic wow. treatment for moderate to severe frown lines, forehead lines, and crow's feet. And here we are in 2024. I'm assuming it, it seems like it's still used for all of that today. So it really hasn't been around for that long. I just wanted to share that. It's still fairly new. Okay. So as we're talking about cosmetics history, I'm going to tie it in with today's womanhood topic, appearance. And also, I'm going to make sure I'm trying really hard not to sound like this podcast kind of reminds me. Do you, do you guys ever go to camp, like a Christian camp, and you have like a modesty night and they would do like a modesty fashion show? And like looking back, it was like so cringy. No offense to camps, but I hope this doesn't come off like that. So sorry if it does. If we're cringy today, just like get a cup of coffee and be cringe with me. Okay. Here in 2024, we are constantly being reminded about our appearance and how to care about it, how to idolize it. Between social media, ads, girlfriends, just scaring, sharing skin tips and tricks, anywhere that sells makeup, workout trends, diet trends, I mean, it's all over the place. Self-care, I feel like skincare, self-care, whatever. It's very common. But for now, we are going to filter out the noise and we're going to see what the Bible has to say about appearance. First Timothy says, Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So how literally are we to take this? Like, is Paul saying I can't wear bubble braids or my grandmother's pearls or like my sterling silver wedding ring with a diamond on it? No, that's not, I don't, I really don't think that's what Paul is saying here. That's not the main takeaway. And honestly, the best part of being a woman is feeling pretty and feminine and the glitter and the glam. I love being a girl and I love the girliness of it. It's the best. So I just think femininity is not dismissed here. That's not what that is saying. The overall idea here is that a godly woman is to prepare herself with the proper preparation, which is not just primping the outward. The point in all of this is that the preoccupation regarding the adornment is to intentionally prepare and enhance your godliness as your best feature. How much time do you allot for yourself to get ready? Okay, I feel like girls, it's, they talk about girl math. I think there's like girl time like in our heads. Go, rewinding back to college when I lived with two other girls who were very girly, just like me. We had the girliest apartment. It was actually um, hot pink, black, and zebra striped. That was like our theme with high heel shoes as decorations. Okay, so we were like legit girls. I loved it. Anyways, when I was in college, if I knew we were going to go out that night, go to dinner, go out with friends, whatever, I would do my girl time, my girl schedule. So I would lay at the pool until a certain amount of time, and I knew the sun was going to go down, but I still had to catch the good rays, you know. And then I would have to time it out for going back to the apartment, and then I would say, if I'm going to wash my hair, I need to give myself an extra 20 minutes. So am I going to do air dry or blow dry? I do need to paint my nails, so I guess I'll do air dry, and then I'll paint my nails while my hair is drying, and then I'll go ahead and finish blow drying my hair just in case, do my makeup, and then or actually I'm going to do a face mask first and then I'm going to do my makeup, et cetera, et cetera. You get the point. So as women, we have this schedule, which obviously that was such a luxury. Now I don't have three hours to get ready. You know what I'm saying? Like when you can actually enjoy getting ready, that's like a really luxurious day. You know, you can like, oh, I have an hour. I'm going to make a cup of coffee and I'm going to take my time getting ready and I'm actually going to enjoy getting ready versus, oh my gosh, I have 15 minutes. Let me get in the shower and throw my hair up and get out of the house. So I think we all can relate to that as women. Maybe I'm the only one that does like a woman time schedule. I don't think so. I think a lot of other women can do that. Okay, so all that to say, why don't I apply the same time to getting my spiritual state ready? Of course, I would never leave the house to go to work without at least brushing my hair, right? And brushing my teeth, washing my face. Why isn't the same necessity brought to getting myself spiritually prepared for the day? I will often leave my house without reading a scripture or saying a prayer, but yet I make sure my appearance looks good on my outside. So why isn't the same schedule? Why isn't there the same routine? Why isn't it broken down? Why don't I break it down to be spiritually, have a spiritually prepared state just like I would do physically? First Timothy is not saying that jewelry, expensive clothing, or a certain hairstyle are by themselves wrong. They become wrong when value is placed on them 
for the purpose of enhancing quality and character. When we allow our appearance to overtake who we are and where we find our purpose, it is wrong. The overall idea is that a woman's appearance should reflect her character, and it will probably reflect her character. I also don't want to miss the end of this verse. It says, but with with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. I know we've all seen it. A very beautiful woman who's very rude or treats people really poorly. This not only reflects her character, but it also affects the beauty that we once saw in that woman. A woman's best outward quality should be our good works and our treatment of others. 1 Peter 3 says, Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on apparel, but it should be the hidden persons of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. A woman's appearance, therefore, should have an eternal focus rather than reflecting a worldly agenda. Scripture encourages an attitude within a woman to be gentle and quiet, which is precious in the sight of God. Does this mean women are doormats? I've said it once in many episodes and I'll say it again. No, women are not to be doormats. These two words are examples of when a woman's heart is her true adornment. Nothing outwardly. When we intentionally pursue our Christ-likeness and grow in our spiritual maturity, Our inward character should manifest itself in a way that it enhances our outward beauty. Proverbs says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord should be praised. So what does it look like for a woman to adorn herself with good character? Well, that's a topic for another episode, but I'll leave you with a few points to reflect on today. And I hope this episode wasn't too cringe. We won't be doing a modesty fashion show. Don't worry. (laughs) How much time do you allot in your daily routine to get spiritually adorned? Is your best outward quality your good works? How can you develop the intentionality to adorn yourself with good character? Well, thanks for listening, friends. I hope it feels very folly where you're at. It's very folly here in Virginia, and I'm drinking coffee. My windows are open. I'm loving the fall vibes. So I hope you're enjoying it too. Enjoy your days, friends. You're an encouragement to me, and I'll be talking to you soon.